Hello, everybody. Today we'll talk about flow engineering. And the, the subtitle of the book, Flow Engineering, is From Value Stream Mapping to Effective Action. And with me here are the two authors, Steve Pereira and Andrew Davies. Hey, Steve. Hey, Andrew. Thanks for joining. Great pleasure. Thanks for having us. Yeah, so Flow Engineering came out pretty recently. And I think a lot of people think of it or talk about it a little bit as a complement to team topologies as like a hugely successful book by now that talks about team structures. And it's, it, it was published in the same publishing house. So I'm wondering if you were looking at team topologies and then flow engineering, what do you bring to the table? What you think is really valuable? You talk about value streams and how does it complement what team topologies is doing? One way to frame it would be that team topologies focus primarily on organizational design and what is a more effective, wise way to design your organizations in a way that's conducive to actually getting work done and minimizing the dependencies and handoffs. And that is, I would say, a critically important step to ensure high performance organizations. But not everybody in the organization has a chance to directly influence organizational design. And even once it's designed, it's something you only touch periodically. There's a lot of other aspects of team topologies, like how the teams coordinate and so forth. But uh, our focus with flow engineering is looking uh, at smoothing out the workflow, no matter what the current organizational structure is. Uh, even if you've already established clear team topologies in line with the book, there still are always performance optimizations. And so that's where we get this title um, from value stream mapping, which would be, for example, optimizing the performance of a stream aligned team to effective action, which is how do, how do we make sure that all of the work that each of the contributors are doing is not being wasted, that the handoffs are short, the work's getting through successfully to production or end users. There's one other aspect that, yeah, thanks. Uh, well, I just wanted to add that I think that another way that flow engineering could be beneficial is in uh, surfacing some indicators that you might go in a specific direction with uh, reorganizing or arranging teams or forming teams. So by mapping a value stream and looking at the workflow that you're currently uh, operating in and surfacing constraints and performance measurements uh, and particularly dependencies. You know, when you map dependencies that can give you a lot of information that can help you understand, okay, well, if we were to separate these teams, if we were to bring these teams closer together, change the way that they interact, um, we might be able to alleviate these constraints that we're seeing improve performance in specific ways that you surface through mapping the value stream. And you already mentioned some of the things that I think are like the big pieces in the book are you have five map types, or I think actually in the end, you have another like a, a bonus map type, so to speak, that you introduced, <laughs> but there are like five key map types that you talk about. And um, you already mentioned, I think some of those, right, with dependencies and these kind of things, maybe we can briefly walk through those and just look at like what the process looks like that you're suggesting that people should follow to follow that incremental process of in, in improving those value streams. I'll let Steve explain the five maps, but I'll, I'll just preface it by saying that, that one of the other aspects of the book is we really delve into the psychology of getting work done, especially these, these three internal concepts of value clarity and flow and value being the thing that's really critically important to have in place if you want your team to be engaged. Disengagement in the workplace is just a massive uh, you know, productivity sink for the whole world. A lack of clarity or disorientation on the part of individual workers is a natural consequence of scale. And so clarity about what am I doing? How do I fit in? What's the whole big picture? How's my work related to the customer? How, how does work get done really at scale? Uh, is, a, is a key second aspect. And the third aspect, you know, the title of the book is flow. And flow really means it is in that same spirit of effective action. You know, this idea, how can I, how can my efforts, my work be both internally satisfying, intrinsically satisfying, like I'm staying in a flow state as much as possible, but also not be wasted where it's, 
I'm enjoying my work and my work is getting used. We're really getting that traction at scale. And that's the opposite of all of the distraction that is so common in workplaces at scale. You know, you've got requests coming in here and there. Work often, you know, doesn't get finished. You've got a lot of work in progress, half finished things. Uh, and so the antidote to that is flow. And you do that with those five map types, I would say, yeah. right? So Steve, if you could just talk briefly about like the idea behind those map types, what they are, we, we don't, I think we don't want like a complete overview, just kind of a, get a feel for, for what you're doing in the sure. book. Yeah, I mean, at, at, at a very high level, why mapping uh, in, in the first place? And, you know, Andrew covered a lot of the kind of personal and individual aspects of these challenges that we see in large organizations, but they're, they're even more consequential when you talk about the whole organization or everybody it takes to kind of deliver value to customers. So mapping is just a way of bringing those people together and having them share their perspectives and thoughts and data and build out a common understanding. So that's why we think of mapping as a superpower and the act of mapping is a way of bringing these people together very, very effectively. Um, but, you know, in terms of the specific maps, we use what we call outcome mapping to understand what is the most important target for us to pursue. And then we look at the current workflow with the value stream map, build out what does it look like to actually do what, what is contributing to that target outcome. And then dependency maps help us dig into the constraint or wherever we see the biggest challenge in that workflow. And future state value stream mapping is about designing a better flow, a better uh, value stream. And then the flow roadmap really pulls all the things that we discovered in the previous maps into something that we could act on. So it's a pretty classical roadmap, but it gets really specific into measurements of success and also ownership of progress. So who's gonna do the things that we think are really important. And that kind of rounds out and completes the, the start to finish. It's ownership. And what I also like a lot, I mean, you also talk about that it's basically a, a way to communicate things, right? Where it's like an understandable thing where everybody contributed in creating it. Everybody can easily understand it. And I think that also has a, has a lot of value to it in terms of just establishing that, that shared goal of what everybody actually wants to get done. Um, it just occurred to me there's another uh, interrelationship between team topologies and flow engineering that flow engineering from one point of view, or sorry, team topologies from one point of view, they're trying to limit the size of the teams to the smallest possible effective team. Um, and so basically create the smallest possible unit of delivering value. But even once you get down to the smallest possible unit of delivering value, there still are silos in that, in the sense of uh, information that's lost between people. And so when Steve talks about the mapping process, we often say the mapping is more important than the map. Because what the mapping does, it starts to break down the silos between all of the members of that team. So you've, you've established your team topologies, you've got a team. Now, how do you help ensure that the team is clearly communicating what's actually going on and creating that clarity and that sense of value and that collective flow? Yeah, I think that 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 once again highlights this nicely complementary nature of uh, what what the team aspect does, and then what that that um, focus on the flow actually can do for you. In terms of reception, the book came out pretty recently. What what have you seen so far? Do people like it? Do you get like good feedback? Is are, are you happy with what you've seen so far? I mean, it must be very satisfying to have something out there to actually get it into the hands of the people. So how does it feel? We, we got invited on Eric Wilde's podcast. So basically, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's the number one thing. <laughs> we have reached Don't untold you. heights. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, I, 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 to, to you know, see people sharing copies of the book online, talking about it. I mean, people people I've not heard of. You know, that, that's kind of the amazing thing. Like people that I've never heard of or never met, like saying, oh, I got this great book. And that's the, it's the slightly disorienting thing about um, writing a book is that it's, it's out of your hands. It's in the wild and it's uh, hopefully having a beneficial impact. Sorry, Steve. No, I, I, I'm 
just thinking back to some stories that I've heard. So I, I've, I've got reports of this being applied in internal auditing procedures. So looking at the start to finish of an audit as a value stream and using flow engineering to improve that, um, uh, content creation campaigns. So for teams who are creating marketing campaigns, they're using flow engineering to, to plot out their entire process and, and look at constraints there. Um, so it, it's kind of reaching out into spaces that we weren't necessarily targeting, even though we've applied it in many, many different contexts. It's just really amazing to see people actually doing that who aren't us, you know, that that's really the wonderful thing. And it, yeah, that's, I mean, it's a very good point. It, actually, it is applicable at a very wide uh, range of, of areas. So it must be pretty interesting to see where that happens. Well, I wish you um, the best of luck with, you know, even more interesting stories that you hear about it. Um, thanks so much for joining today. Uh, do you have any last words for our viewers about, you know, flow engineering? Here's why you should do it. But. Thank you very much for having us. Uh, you know, I think that my, you know, my message to people would be, it, it's really freeing to be able to understand how things are happening in your organization at a deeper level. And it's even more consequential when you can do that with other people and create this collective sense of understanding. And you kind of unlock this new level of collaboration and unity with people who you might have thought of in another silo, you know, with totally separate concerns, it's an opportunity to come together. So I, I, I find it very uh, helpful for that. And, and I hope folks do as well. And the only thing that I would, I would say on this is that, um, you know, people often think of these uh, activities like, you know, bringing a group together, you know, having some workshop, optimizing workflow as something that an outside consultant would be needed for or some kind of a, you know, an expert facilitator, but we, we wrote the book and designed it specifically in such a way that running these exercises should be as easy as hosting a board game that, you know, if people go out, they buy a board game, they take it home. There's a set of instructions for the host and a shorter set of instructions for the guests. If you can read the instructions on a board game and you can host a board game, uh, then you can host a flow engineering exercise. Now, if it's your first time ever, don't make it like a massive multi-million dollar initiative for the company. <laughs> but like, you can get started with this, and that was our whole point to to not to to really lower the barrier of entry, what we call the on-ramp gap, to make it very very accessible for people and fun. That one actually, I'm really curious to see how that goes. I would bet that people read the book and they kind of buy into the premise, but they still probably might you know, appreciate some help and say, Hey, you know, can you help us running those things? You've done it 20 times. So why not help us with it? So, so we'll see how that goes. But I, I, I would say that's another likely thing that can happen that the book kind of becomes the on-ramp for the process, but then the process actually becomes something that people are doing. We'll see. Okay. Um, again, we thanks so much for joining and, um, Andrew, I didn't want to cut you just, off. Uh, we, we'd love to help. So if, if you're wondering about how to take that step or take that plunge, just reach out to us, right? There's a, find us on LinkedIn. That's place place where we're most active and we'd be delighted to help. Uh, and, but our hope is that there gradually are communities that form where people are helping each other and building confidence together. Because you're right. I mean, you're right. There's a, a huge gap between reading a book and diving in, but we just want to make it as accessible as possible. Sorry to interject. Okay. Yeah. So everybody just email Steve and Andrew. They're happy to help. Uh, <laughs> thanks everybody for watching. If you liked it, please give a thumbs up, consider subscribing and until next time, keep getting APIs to work. Bye everybody.